Hi, I'm Rick Dior, and this is the first part of a series all about gongs. So in, in this series, I'm going to uh, focus on gongs that I use in professional situations. This isn't really the kind of meditative 
gong video that you may be used to seeing. Uh, these are all gongs that I use in my professional life, uh, playing shows, playing with orchestras, doing movie soundtracks, things like that. So I wanted to share this with you. I don't have anything really large here. Uh, the largest gong I have here is a 28 inch wind gong. I have two of these. Uh, they're two different pitches. I'll play you those. Here's the higher one. And here's the lower one. So in the recordings I do here in the studio, those are my go-to real, you know, gong sound. If someone says, I want a gong, these sound like the classic gong sound. And these are Feng wind gongs, and they're really not that expensive. Best deal going pretty much in gongs. Uh, they're made by the Wuhan uh, corporation sold to other companies like LP and stuff who distribute them. So um, these are fantastic instruments. Uh, you see here I have a 20 inch version of it. And that's really great for soft notes and it also fits in tight setups. So all of these instruments, like I said earlier, I use uh, almost on a regular basis. Now I do have some here that I included that I don't use on a regular basis and those are the tune gongs. So in back of me here we have these Thai nipple gongs. So let's explain uh, the difference between a gong and a tam-tam. Well actually there's really not that much of a difference as far as composers who write parts. They mix them up all the time. But a gong will have some sort of nipple like this and it can be tuned with that nipple. A tam-tam is flat, so these would be considered tam-tams, all these flat things. But you could argue, hey, that's a flat nipple there, and that's what gives it its sound. So in these opera gongs, we have this large nipple here, which results in a bending of the pitch because the, um, the center of it is thinner than the rest of it. All right, and I will get into these opera gongs in a minute. You've all heard those on movie soundtracks. So these here are called heng gongs, H-E-N-G, and they're different because they have a lip, almost like the inside of a snare drum here. It doesn't bend over, though. And uh, these are thicker than most gongs, okay? And they're very bell-like in tone. So this, this is the largest one I have today. It's almost like a chime-like. So these are very musical sounding and they're not your typical gong sound. As far as implements to hit them, we'll go through all that. I'll probably separate this into two different videos because it'll be too long. But you saw there my little weird demo that I was using, you know, a bow and then a chain and then a stick at the end and then all these different kinds of mallets. Uh, so that's important too, and we'll go over that. And then also you saw the Super Bowl, ma Super Bowl, <laughs> Super Bowl's coming up, but Super Bowl mallets, which I used to do these little whales of despair. And that sounds going to be a lot different, like on a chow gong. Oh, and I didn't talk about the chow gongs, but a chow gong looks like this. So I'll take it down. This is a miniature version of it. This is uh, basically uh, in the pitch of C, so pretty much, but it's not really a tuned gong per se. Uh, this is a 10 inch one. They make them as small as seven inches and they go up to, you know, 60 inches, which is just giant. Uh, you're never probably gonna need a gong that big except to show off. So put that back. Uh, so that's what, that is. So the chow gongs are the ones that you'll see a lot in orchestras. They're the lowest pitched gongs. They have a very thick metal rim. Then right behind me here is uh, my small Pisces. I do have a larger one. Uh, this is a symphonic gong. Uh, Pisces has been making these forever. Any of you went to see uh, shows, you know, Led Zeppelin, uh, other bands in the 70s, or in the, even the 60s, late 60s, would see the drummer sometimes had a gong. And at the end of the show, they'd hit it. They'd be go crazy. And, you know, but uh, this is uh, what that gong is. It's a Peiste symphonic gong. These can get up to 80 inches, which is a obviously a special order. Uh, they got to bring a truck to bring the thing. Uh, so, and God knows what that would cost because these things are expensive. But these are sort of the go-to as well as the chow gongs 
for an orchestra setting where you need that big gong sound. So this one's small, uh, but it's got a pleasant sound. Somewhat traditional. And it's great for bowing because it has this kind of sharp lip behind it. So. So that's my favorite bowing gong right there. Chow gongs also work well. So we talked about these hang gongs, tie nipple gongs, wind gongs, chow gongs, that's a small one, and the symphonic gongs. So we also have opera gongs. And the opera gongs, like I said earlier, have a sort of thinner um, middle there. This, they, and they're shaped like conical, if you see that. Okay, it's a very different sound, and these are used, obviously, in Chinese opera. And it's a great sound, and a lot of times they're mounted like this, or they can be flat on a table. And the harder you hit them, the more they bend. And different ones, thinner ones, bend more. They're not tuned to any specific pitch, so uh, you just have to get a bunch of them and try them out. So when I picked these out, I, I picked ones that, um, that had the most distinct pitches. Now you can also play those these with sticks. It's a pretty cool sound. Really, whatever you come up with. And uh, right here, these are called bowl gongs, okay? So you might see these in a temple, temple gong, some people call them. And I have several of these too. These are just two of my favorites. Beautiful ring sounds. Now all these are going to sound different too, depending on the thickness. So, uh, you know, these are used for a lot of ceremonial things and meditation and things like that. You can keep things in them, whatever. Somebody's going to get mad at me. I better stop. All right. Uh, so let's talk for a minute just about Boeing, because I got a ton of questions about that, uh, about effects. So the first thing you want to do is get a good bow. A bass bow is what you want. And you want to use rosin and rosin that sucker up. You know you're doing it when it, the rosin actually sings. Okay. And then you can uh, bow things like symbols. I don't know if we'll, this will be in the camera view, but here's a symbol. All right, and you can bow once again the gong easily. Now, the one bad thing about a wind gong, it's hard to bow. So you'll see. So almost nothing comes out. So I do not recommend that uh, that kind of gong for bowing. If you need to bow, get a peisty, small one like this, a symphonic gong, or a chow gong uh, like this one here, okay? A big one, at least a 22-inch one, but a 32 is better. So as far as mallets go, I like these yarn mallets. These are my go-to. You can get all kinds of mallets that... Um, some have these kind of hockey pucks and they're wrapped with felt. They're fine. But I've always used these. I feel like I have a connection to the instrument when it's wound with this tight yarn, kind of like a vibe mallet. So. Now, one thing I'd, I'd like to say is the size of the gong is very uh, related to the mallet you hit it with. So this mallet, which is pretty big, is not great for this little gong. It only works well on these bigger ones. So you want to get a smaller one with a smaller head and almost a little harder there, so that works better. And for your really small gongs like these, then this is overkill, and you want to use sort of like this uh, Mike Balter wind gong mallet. So.
That way the gongs will speak quickly and clearly. Uh, that's very, very important. And I found these old Mike Balter vibe mallets with the giant heads. I can't remember what these were called, but I, I got a lot of these from Mike. I love these things, even on vibes, obviously. Uh, they sound great. And they're really good on gongs. So. <laughs> kill all this ring <laughs> uh, so that's that's what I recommend using all right now when you roll on a gong there's lots of ways to do it so uh, these mallets work great these blue gong mallets. unfortunately uh, mine are at the opera right now and speaking of that actually it just reminded me of something maybe I'll take a video of it but we're doing Madame Butterfly right now which is a great Buccini opera and it uses tune gongs uh, which is awesome it's an awesome part and I usually play that part but they didn't have room in the pit for the gongs so what I'm doing is I'm playing a vibraphone and then I'm playing one of these hang gongs, a big one like this, with it. And maybe I'll take a video of that uh, tonight when I go to work and you'll get to hear that. And it sounds pretty convincing. So when you're in a jam for tune gongs, that's a good solution. This is gong and vibes. So back to this, when you're rolling on a gong, and I'll roll with these for now. Normally on the bigger gongs, I would use this. There's a couple ways to do it. One way is to stand on the side of the gong and do this right below center. Another way is to actually do it with, you know, your butt to the gong like this. And in certain repertoire, like Stravinsky, Rite of Spring, uh, Mars from Holst the Planets, you actually need that, your rear end, to help you. So you're doing these rolls. So you can muffle with the, with the back of your body there. All right? So that's uh, something that I get asked a lot by students. How do I do these really short rolls? And that's one way to do them. Use your body to muffle. So these are just the very, very basics. And we'll probably do another video where we get into more of this. But I just want to give you a good overview. These mounts right here are ones that come with the wind gongs. They're stock. I just want to play these for you. So... So those work really, really well, uh, but I don't normally use them because they're kind of short and cheap and uh, they're always different sizes and all that. So, But they, they should come with the wind gong. And this right here is one of my favorite all gong mallets. I took the top off, but it's a shorty. And the shorty mallets are great uh, if you're doing two things at once and you want control with one hand. So if you're doing... So I'd recommend either cutting down a mallet and rounding at the end or, or, um, or getting, if you can find a short mallet, this thing's got to be 40, 50 years old. I've had it since I was a kid. Uh, and finally today, all we're going to talk about uh, for the rest of the time, in a couple minutes, is just these tune gongs. So these are Thai tune gongs. This one is a C, I believe. Yep. And uh, I have like two octaves of these. And then also you can get tune gongs, sort of the chow kind of gong. Sounds like an E maybe. So they're good to have, but not anything you necessarily need right now or ever really. Normally you can rent stuff like that. So that's just something over the years that you can collect. And uh, I've used them on pieces that I write and... and movie soundtracks and things like that. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this introduction to gongs. In the next video, we'll get a little more into techniques um, of these things. But it's very, very important to know about this. There's some really great videos on YouTube that show much bigger gongs. And I would definitely suggest looking at those. You can go through them. Some are more a little earthy than others. But, um, but I use gongs in a professional 
uh, situation, performance situation, where uh, a lot of those are more for meditation and just, you know, some people want to own a gong so when they come home they can hit it. So, so I hope you enjoyed this and we'll see you next time.